Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all out this morning. Thank you so much for being here. If you're visiting with us, we give an extra special welcome, whether in person or online. And we thank you for taking the time this morning. We're going to begin our worship of the Lord this morning by singing together, Thou whose almighty word chaos and darkness heard and took their flight, hear us, we humbly pray. And where the gospel day sheds not its glorious ray, let there be light. Standing together as we worship the Lord this morning. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to come before the Lord and seek his help and his blessing on our gathering this morning. We want to remember those, especially at this time, that are mourning. There's been quite a lot of funerals in the area in these last few days. And uh, just to let you know as well, Heather's away to a funeral this afternoon. An uncle of hers passed away at the end of the week. And uh, she's away to that funeral today. And then uh, my sister's father-in-law's funeral will be on Wednesday. So it's, it's just one of those weeks. And uh, we know that others have been bereaved in the week that's gone by. We want to continue to bring all these people before the Lord in prayer. And let's just come to the Lord now and seek his help for this morning. Let's pray. <laughs> Our blessed God and loving Heavenly Father, as we bow before thee this morning, we are struck with the majesty and the awe of our Almighty God. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that as we are coming before thee, we are indeed coming before the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're coming to the throne of God the Father in the name of God the Son and with the intercession of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, that he makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And Father, there are some prayers in our hearts that we can't even put words to. We thank Thee, Father, that He takes those groanings of our hearts and He makes them understandable in heaven. We thank You, Father, that in the deepest and darkest hours of life, we who are saved know that we are forever in the hands and in the arms of the Almighty God. We thank Thee, Father, that though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. And we thank you, Father, that for us it's only a shadow. It's not something that can ever truly separate us from thee. In fact, Lord, we thank thee for the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ when he rose again from the dead. 
and granted resurrection power unto each one of his children. Lord, we thank thee that we who are saved, when we cease this earthly life, we immediately enter into the presence of God. We thank you, Father, that for us life does not end. It is indeed eternal life. And Lord, what a wonderful privilege it is to know that we have that life within us. And Father, we come this morning to return our thanks to Thee and to give You worship and praise, not just because of what You've done for us, but because You're worthy of praise. This hymn that we've sung has already reminded us of the first great creative work of that creation week, Let There Be Light. And there was light. And it was so simple for thee. Lord, just with a word, you you brought light into existence. You brought the heaven and earth into existence. You brought life on this planet into existence. And Father, we praise thee because you are the Almighty. We praise thee, Father, because you are holy and good and righteous. We also praise thee, Father, because you're loving and merciful and gracious. And Father, we pray that our hearts would be filled with praise of Thee this morning. We pray, Lord, that the songs that we sing will be truly worship in Thine ears. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we open the Word of God, that You would speak to our hearts and that we would praise Thee for the ability and the understanding that You have given us through the Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord, that Thy Word would indeed impress itself upon us this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have of enjoying fellowship together, that we are bound together in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are one body, and Lord, we praise thee for that. And Lord, that there is nothing that can separate us from thy great love. Heavenly Father, we have committed sins this past week. Lord, we are sinners saved by grace. We are not perfect. We're far from it. And we thank you that there's a day coming when we shall be made perfect. But we thank Thee that until then we have forgiveness available to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that we'll have come this morning, Father, having prepared our hearts, having come confessing those sins and making sure that we're here, Lord, to enjoy fellowship with Thee without anything to hinder that fellowship. And Father, we pray that as we would remember our Savior this morning, that You would bless that time of remembrance. Bless the one, Lord, that would Bring a thought from thy word, and we pray that you would enable him and help him, Lord, to turn our eyes once again to Calvary. Help me, Father, we pray that in all that takes place this morning, glory and honor will be brought unto thy name. We remember, Lord, those who can't be with us this morning for whatever reason, whether it's age or illness or or for some other reason. Father, we pray that you would draw graciously near to them. They need thy help and thy grace. They need thy strength. And Lord, we pray that they would know it this morning. And perhaps some of them are even listening online. And Father, we thank Thee that they can have that, at least that fellowship with us. And, and Lord, we do pray for them. And pray, Father, that they too will be blessed by Thy Word. And Lord, we pray that they would know the nearness of Thy presence today. And Lord, there are those that are mourning. We have heard of many that have gone into eternity in this past week and their families and friends are left behind mourning their loss, Lord. And we just pray that You would draw graciously near to, to those we pray, Heavenly Father, that, that they would know comfort because all comfort comes from Thee. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that You would grant unto them the knowledge that Christ has overcome death and, Lord, that victory is ours through Christ. And for those that aren't yet saved, Lord, that they would realize that they need to trust in the Savior as well so that they too one day will know that victory and be resurrected with a new body and able to spend eternity with Thee. So, Father, we leave all these things before Thee. Father, there's so much happening in this world, so much evil and wickedness that would overwhelm us. But, Heavenly Father, we thank You that it doesn't overwhelm Thee, that God is still on the throne and He will remember His own. And though trials may press us and burdens distress us, He never will leave us alone. Lord, help us to enjoy Thy presence in this place this morning. For Thy dear name's sake, Amen. Now, boys and girls, we're going to sing before common. Have we children's talk with you this morning? We're going to sing, Thou art a wonderful God. Thou art a wonderful God. Thou made us the mountains, Thou made us the sea, Thou made us the songbirds that fly over me. Thou art a wonderful God. And whenever we come towards the end, I'll come down and speak to you this morning.
Well, good morning, boys and girls. Yes, there's some awake this morning. That's good. That's good. Well, I've got something to show you this morning, and this is something that you might, if you were watching TV yesterday, and if you happen to be very, you know, very intellectual and thinking, oh, I want to expand my knowledge. Well, you wouldn't watch the BBC news, but uh, you might have watched the news yesterday, and it might have been on whenever you were sitting at dinner or something, I don't know, but you might have heard about this, that yesterday was a very special day, but I'm going to show you this here first of all. Anybody know what this is? Yeah. It is a flag, yep. Now, if I do that, okay, and then I'm going to get this just right. Do that. There's the flag. Now, what flag is this? Israel. Israel. This is the Israel flag. And it's a very, very special flag. The star in the middle is called the Magan David. That's the star of David. And you see the colors, blue and white? There's a reason why this flag are those colors. But I'm just thinking I might leave that for next week. I think I'll leave that for next week. I'll get you think, get to guessing on that one. All right, so that's going to be next week's children's talk. But this is a flag that you might have seen on the news. You'll certainly have seen it if you've been watching TV at all in recent months because of the, all the fighting that's going on in Gaza and around Israel at the minute. And it's very, very sad to see all that. But this flag was very, very important yesterday especially because yesterday was a very special and a very sad day for the Jewish people. I'm just going to put this up here so I don't have to hold it all the time. All right, so if I put this here, oops, like this. There we go. All right. Because yesterday, if we move on just a couple, Tim, please. All right. Yesterday was International Holocaust Remembrance Day. How many people have heard of the Holocaust? Not many. The Holocaust was something that was very, very sad because during the Second World War, the Nazis that were running Germany at the time, including a man that was very, very evil called Adolf Hitler, hated the Jews so much that he wanted to kill them all. And during the wor World War II, at least six million Jewish people were killed. Now, it didn't start off with a lot of killing. In fact, if we see the next picture, this is what it started off with. They were told that they had to wear a yellow star, and that's Jude. It says, it looks like Jude, but it's Jude, which is, or Jude, which is German for Jew. And whenever they were living in Germany or any place that Germany went in and took over, any Jews had to wear this yellow star so that everybody could see that they were a Jew. And people were allowed to hurt them when they saw them. They were allowed to break the windows of their shops. And there was one night in Germany called Kristallnacht, whenever so many shop windows were broken, all they could hear all night was glass breaking. And it was an attack on the Jews. But then it went, got worse than that, because if you were a Jew, eventually soldiers came to your house, and they took you away. And here's the, one of the places that they took you to. This is a place called Auschwitz, and it's in Poland. And on the left-hand side, you can see it in color. That's what it's like today. And on the right-hand side, you see what it was like whenever they were bringing the Jews. And they brought them by train. And these aren't normal train carriages that you would go in and sit on and with nice, comfortable seats. These were cattle cars. This is what they used to bring, carry cattle in whenever they were on the trains. And they put hundreds of people into these cattle cars, thousands and thousands and thousands of them. But there were loads that were packed in really tight into each car. And they brought them to Auschwitz and they took them out. And whenever they got there, they put them into two lines. And one line was taken away and they were taken to a building and they were told they were going to get a shower. But they didn't when they were locked in and they were killed. Just like that. If they thought they were too weak, or too young, they took them into those places and they killed them straight away. But those who didn't get taken, they went another way and they went through a gate, and this is going to be the gate of it here that they went through. That's the gate of Auschwitz. 
Not a very nice looking place, is it? Quite scary looking. And you see this above the, above the fence there. It says, Arbeit macht frei. It means work makes free. And they were told if, whenever they went into these camps that uh, if you work hard, someday you'll be free. Someday you'll be able to get out. But it was all a lie. Because they went on through the gate and went down this next wee bit. And you see the barbed wire on both sides and the blocks that they, that they ended up having to, to live in. And then we see what happened next. There's the women. How would you like to live every day in a place like that? Those are beds, but they don't have mattresses. It's just wooden beds. And they, and they didn't even have enough for all of the people that were there. They just treated them so, so badly. And it wasn't just men and women. Look at the next one. There were children there as well. They took Jewish children into those camps. And sadly, most of the people that went into those camps died. And the, the really sick thing about the, the Nazis that were doing this, they had a name for what they were doing. Here's the name for it. The final solution. You see, they believed that the Jews were the problem of everything that was going on, wrong in the world. They blamed the Jews for everything. And so they said, the solution is just to get rid of them. If we just destroy all of the Jews then everything will be solved. The world will be a wonderful place. But it was all lies. But their goal was to wipe out all of the Jews in the world. Now, that was a very dangerous thing to do for them because the Jews are God's special people. God loves the Jewish people way, 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 way back to the time of Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob and then the 12 sons of Jacob, that's where the Jewish people came from. And God loves them so much, and he's got a very special plan for the Jewish people. And he's going to keep them, and he's go going to make sure that nobody is able to wipe them out. And the Germans just didn't know that, or they didn't believe it. But listen to what God said. Now, this was written about two and a half thousand years before the Holocaust. God said, thus saith the Lord, this is in Jeremiah, which giveth the sun for a light by day and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night. Okay, now that, this, is, this is important. He says, God made the sun and the moon and the stars. Now look at the next verse. It says, if those ordinances, if the sun, the moon, and the stars depart before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Now, that's a lot of words, isn't it? So let's have a look. We'll break it down a wee bit and see what, it, what it's saying. God is saying if the sun, the moon, and the stars can be destroyed, or if they just disappear, then Israel will stop being my special people. But if the sun, the moon, and the stars remain, then Israel will still be my special people. And he says they'll be my people for always, forever. Boys and girls, there's, very, there's only one way that Hitler could get rid of the Jews, and only one way that the terrorists around Israel today can get rid of the Jews, and that's just to destroy the sun, moon, and stars. Now, do you think any of them were able to do that? No, of course not. They can't do that. So God has made a promise to the land of Israel, and he said, although bad things might happen to you, I will make sure that there will always be the Jewish people. And I will make sure that they will be a nation of mine. And I will look after them. Now, that's very important for us. What has God made there? When he said all that, what has he made? A promise. He's made a promise. That's right. And he's made a promise to you and me as well. God always keeps his promises. So let's see one of the promises that God has made to us. And this is in 1 John chapter 2, verse 25. He says, and this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. Now, is that something that everybody already has? No, that's right, Nadra. We don't already have it whenever we're born. We need to get it. We're not born with eternal life. Not the kind of life that God's talking about. 
We need to get that life. And we get that life when we repent of our sin, when we admit that we're a sinner and we ask the Lord Jesus to forgive us for our sin. Then, then we have eternal life. And that's God's promise. Now, eternal means forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So do you think God could break that promise? Do you think he could? No. He couldn't break the promise that he made to Israel. He won't make the prom break the promise that he made to us either. So there's another promise that we have. And boys and girls, this is why it's so important why Israel survives. Because if Israel and the Jewish people could ever be wiped out, then God will have broken his promise. And as long as Israel remain, God keeps his promise. And because God will always keep his promise, Israel's going to remain. And if we've trusted in the Lord Jesus, we will have eternal life and nothing will ever take us away from God. That's as strong a promise as you could ever get. More, more strong than any promise that any other person could make to you. The promise that God has given us eternal life. Isn't that wonderful? So the Jewish people are very, very special. And whenever we remember what happened to them in the Holocaust, we're remembering how wicked those people were to try to kill them all. And how sad it was that so many of them were killed. But how wonderful it is that God preserved them and let them keep going. And in fact, just three years after the end of the war, the country of Israel was formed. That's God keeping his promise. And we, and we can trust the promises that he's given to us as well. Thank you so much for listening. Let's have a wee word of prayer before Michael comes with the announcements. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do remember all the sad things that happened, especially to the Jewish people in the Second World War. And we think about the land of Israel today and how so many uh, just want them to stop existing and they're trying to kill them and they're trying to get rid of them. But Father, we thank you that your promises will always be kept and that Israel is a nation that's very, very precious and very special to you. And you will make sure that the Jewish people will keep going. And we praise you for that because that's you keeping your promise. And just as you keep your promises to the Jewish people, you will keep your promises to each one of us. And we thank you for that wonderful promise that everyone who trusts in you and has their sins forgiven will have eternal life, life that can never be taken away from them. And we pray, dear God, that if there's any boy or girl or any grown up who hasn't yet trusted you as Savior, that they would even do that this morning and they would have that eternal life for themselves as well. Thank you for loving us and thank you for all of your promises. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. Boys and girls, you head back to your seats. Thank you for, so much for listening. And Michael's going to come with the announcements. Very good morning to everyone. You're all very welcome. Bally Clare Baptist Church this morning. After this morning's service will be the Lord's table. All who are walking in fellowship with the Lord are invited to stay and remember him in his own appointed way. All women are requested to have their heads covered in accordance with his scriptural pattern. Our own pastor David will speak at both services today. At the evening service there will be a testimony from Brian Galt. And the title of that is Luke, No Hands. Also at the evening service, Heavenly Sunshine will bring a message in song. Please, if you can, invite people along to this testimony night. We've had wonderful experiences with many, many people coming in over the weeks. So please bring those that you can along. A time of prayer precedes both services, 11 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. each Lord's Day. And a slight change to that prayer meeting. This room at the back is the room that we normally use for the prayer meeting. But we can't, we've been put out because of Sunday school. The Sunday school is expanding. They have to use that room at the back. Praise the Lord for that. So the prayer meeting will be in the vestry, just in the wee corridor behind. So remember that, men, please, if you can, come along there. Tuesday at 8 p.m. is a prayer and Bible study again with our own brother, David. 
Friday night, this Kids Zone and the Youth Fellowship at 6.30. Next Lord's Day, David will be speaking at both services. And the Sunday School and Bible class will be at 10.15 next Lord's Day. Please remember all the missions we support from the church, especially our own brother Stephen working with Shining Lights. Remember those who are unwell and waiting for hospital treatment at this time. And also a special announcement, youth choir practice next Sunday evening after the evening service. This is in preparation for Youth Sunday. This is for youth fellowship and young adults. I take it I'm not in that. No? Oh, well. <laughs> now, all these announcements are made in the will of the Lord. Thank you. He tries every year. One of these years, we might just let him. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Now, we're going to sing again before we turn to God's Word. Join all the glorious names of wisdom, love, and power that mortals ever knew, that angels ever bore. All are too mean to speak his worth, too mean to set my Savior forth. Standing again to sing, please. Amen. 
Now we're turning to Ephesians chapter 4 again this morning, please. Ephesians chapter 4. Just while you're turning to that this morning, could I ask you please also to remember uh, Brother Ian's mother at this time. She's very, very poorly in hospital at the moment. And do please continue to bring her and the rest of the family before the Lord at this time. And we would appreciate your prayers. Ephesians chapter 4 then this morning, please. And verse 11. I'm going to read just what we read last week, just to keep the context together, and we're reading down to verse 16. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Amen. We pray again that God would bless His word to our hearts. Henceforth, from this moment on, we're to die to self so that we're prepared to live a new kind of life. We're to live unto Christ. We're to have Him as the focus and the drive of all that we say, think, and do. And last week, we set the scene for our third henceforth, seeing how God has provided us with help for growing in faith, all with the intent that we be and remain united as one body in Christ. And we're continuing to look at growing in faith this morning, and we're staying in this passage. We're moving into verse 14 this morning. We may even get into verse 15, uh, depends how things go, but we're starting in verse 14. We're looking at the perils of not growing in faith, the perils of not growing in faith. Look at verse 14 again. It says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, that we henceforth be no more children. Spiritual life, like physical life, begins with infancy. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul said to the Corinthian church, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. You see, those that are new, that, that is newly born again haven't yet learned how to grasp or understand the things that are spiritual. Their life to that point has been purely physical and emotional and mental, what Paul calls carnal. Suddenly, a new perspective is added in, the spiritual. And it's going to take time for a newborn believer in Christ to get used to that new kind of life, that new perspective, that new kind of sensory input, as it were. Yet the exception is, or the, sorry, the expectation is that that new believer grows and matures in their spiritual life so that the carnal becomes less influential and the spiritual becomes more dominant. That's what growing in faith means. It's becoming more attuned to the spiritual. The spiritual way of thinking exerts more and more control over the mental and then the emotional and then the physical as we mature in faith. So what's the danger of not maturing? as we should. Well, that's what's Paul, what Paul's showing us here in verse 14. And the first symptom of stunted spiritual growth is that the carnal believer, the, un, the immature believer, is unstable in doctrine. Unstable in doctrine. Paul says that spiritual children tend to be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. The phrase tossed to and fro means, and I quite like this expression, means to be wave-pitched It describes a boat caught in a storm with no means of control. 
the helm's unresponsive, the sails are torn or the engine's out of order, the rudder's broken and one wave comes and lifts the boat up to the crest, but as it passes, it drops down into another trough and the waves are coming from different directions, gradually pushing the boat off course. Think of the disciples out on the, out on the Sea of Galilee in a fishing boat during the night. In Matthew 14, 24, it says, But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. The parallel passage in Mark chapter 6 adds that they were toiling and rowing. They were struggling and rowing. They weren't getting anywhere because the wind was contrary unto them. Contrary winds are describing winds that keep changing direction. And that's what it's like for the, the, the immature believer in Christ. The movement of the boat the disciples were in describes the movement in a spiritual sense of immature believers. A wind of doctrine comes along and they're swept along with it. But what winds of doctrine are we talking about? Well, there's so many that we could never possibly go into them all. But let me give you some that I've come across uh, in my life and the ones that I've seen in others. Uh, and among these are some theories that some Christians have been distracted by to the point of obsession. Believe it or not, among some, there's a belief in a flat earth. There's been a resurgence in flat earth theology. Now, it's totally anti-biblical. The Bible says that the Lord sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the circle of the earth is talking about a horizon, something you don't have with a disk, but you do have with a sphere. So the Bible teaches that the earth is a sphere. But for some reason, they're distracted by this and they're caught up in it and it becomes the topics of their conversation. Some, another thing is the mark of the beast as it's seen in barcodes or in the COVID vaccine or in a cashless society. Folks, if you're saved, you're not going to see the mark of the beast. You'll never see it. You might see things that are preceding it and maybe leading up to it, but you're not going to see the mark of the beast. You don't need to worry about those things if you're a saved person. Believe it or not, there are some also who believe that God has put a curse on black people because of the curse that he pronounced after Ham uh, laughed at Noah in a particular manner. Folks, there is no such curse upon black people. It doesn't exist. The curse wasn't upon Ham, it was upon Canaan, his son. And those descendants of Canaan no longer are around today. There's some idea that 5G is causing everything from mind control to genetic manipulation. Or that Israel has been replaced by the church. Well, it hasn't. Uh, and world governments being controlled by Freemasons or the Illuminati. I don't know whether they have that control or not, but it's not relevant to our service for the Lord. Some would still say that the Pope is the Antichrist. He's not. He may be an antichrist, but to all intents and purposes now, he's not the antichrist, unless something changes after we're taken to glory. And then there's differences of interpretation that Christians disagree on, but some who are immature keep bouncing between them, about different worship styles, the gifts of the Spirit, including tongues and, he tongues and healing, Deliverance ministries, casting demons out of Christians, something that cannot happen because we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Delivering believers from generational curse. I remember one time hearing a man who was talking on this kind of issue, uh, and he happened to say that if, if you had a grandparent or a great-grandparent who was into witchcraft, then you had to be delivered from the curse of that because it went to three or four generations. That's not what the Bible teaches on that. There's the whole debate concerning prophetic views, pre-mill, a-mill, post-mill, and some are pan-mill. Calvinism, Arminianism, and neither. Believer's baptism, infant baptism, adult baptism, plus dipping, pouring, or sprinkling, whatever the format is. And people get uh, confused by these. They don't look into the Word of God for themselves, that they're carried about Somebody else comes along and preaches something different and they think it sounds good so they follow them. Why? Because they're not mature in the faith. They haven't established themselves and, uh, and established convictions within themselves and what the Bible teaches. That's why it's important to mature in the faith. We could go on and on and, and talk about many, many more uh, issues. But the point is that immature believers tend to bounce around 
from doctrine to doctrine. They will tend to keep changing churches rather than settling in one place. They follow after one Christian personality after another after another. They get caught up in whatever is the fad or the trend of the moment. They're very easily influenced by charismatic personalities, emotional arguments, impressive media productions. So if a believer isn't growing in faith, they're leaving themselves vulnerable to being unstable in doctrine. Now, closely associated with that is a second danger. They're unable to discern. They're unable to discern. See, one of the influences that makes the immature believer unstable in doctrine is, as Paul says here in verse 14, the slight of men. The slight of men. The word slight is interesting. It comes from the Greek word for dice, which in ancient times was one of the primary ways of gambling. So the word slight is speaking of gambling. It's speaking of taking chances, or as we would say here in Northern Ireland, chance in your arm. That's what these uh, preachers, these false teachers are doing. Another aspect of the work of the word is something that we're still familiar with today, the concept of loaded dice. In other words, cheating. So when we think of the slight of men, we're thinking of those who chance their arm as they try to cheat or scam their way to success or to popularity or to wealth. It's basically just one big con game. And these men and women are the grifters. and Their followers are the marks, their targets. And the product that they're offering is some twisted version of Christianity that has enough similarities with the real thing that it sounds good and it sounds convincing but it also includes some kind of hook to catch their marks, catch their targets. Now, that hook might be offering health and wealth. If their if they're followers, uh, with a little bit of faith, invest in the ministry, they tell them that their investment is an investment in God's work and an act of faith that God promises to reward. I've even seen one advert on one of those televangelist programs trying to sell bottles of water, just ordinary bottles of water, that are meant to have some Holy Spirit endowed power of blessing to them. And they're charging something like $10 for each bottle. Uh, They churn out books and videos and other merchandise for their followers to buy. Those books have catchy self-help style titles, and they usually have a a picture of the con artist on the front flashing a great big toothy grin with impossibly white teeth. And you'll have heard of some of the people that I'm talking about. People like Joel Osteen, Joyce Meyer, Creflo Dollar, Kenneth Copeland, T.D. Jakes, Jesse Duplantis, Joseph Prince. Uh, And these people are all on so-called Christian TV. I know there's many of you like listening to David Jeremiah, and I agree with you that he's a very good Bible teacher, and I'm not criticizing him or his ministry. I'm not looping him in with these people, by the way. His messages are available on the TV station TBN, Trinity Broadcasting Network. Well, last night, David Jeremiah was on TBN at 9 p.m. That was after Christian World News at 8.30 and at 8 o'clock, just an hour before he start, David Jeremiah was on, Joseph Prince was on, who's one of these health, wealth, prosperity preachers. It seems that TBN can't discern between the good teaching of David Jeremiah and the heretical teaching of Joseph Prince. And they aren't the only ones. Daystar TV has most of the same word of faith charlatans that I've already mentioned. But then also has David Jeremiah. They have Adrian Rogers, who I still think is one of the best preachers that America has seen. They have the Way of the Master, which is purely evangelical about how to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they have Charles Stanley, biblically sound. We may disagree on some points uh, on some of these preachers, but I would still consider them to be good Bible preachers, especially since COVID. Christians have tuned in to Christian TV streaming services and YouTube channels, and while there's some good content, there's a lot of heretical stuff as well. And as believers, we have a duty to be discerning 
in what we watch and in what we listen to. Listen to what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Now, to know what's good, you have to be discerning. You have to be able to discern what's good and what's not good. John says in 1 John 4 and verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world, and they're really getting out into the world over the airwaves. But discernment comes with spiritual maturity. By the way, spiritual maturity is not necessarily related to physical age. There are some very immature older believers and some very mature young believers. Growing in faith doesn't have to be limited to a chronological time frame, but we need to be growing in faith. We need to be maturing in the faith. So we've seen two dangers of not growing in faith, unstable in doctrine, unable to discern. The third one is this, unprepared for deception. Unprepared for deception. Look again at verse 14. Another influence, according to Paul, that can make immature believers unstable, he says in verse 14, and cunning craftiness. Cunning craftiness. Now, this is speaking of those who are willing to do anything to achieve their goals, not in a good way. They're willing to do absolutely anything. They're manipulative. They have no convictions of their own. They adjust their message. They adjust their style, their language, their teachings to suit whoever they want to attract. Their, their teaching keeps changing just to suit whoever's there. It also describes those who mix a bit of truth in with the error or who speak mostly truth and add a bit of error to suit their own aims. Like the slight of men, these false teachers are charlatans. They're spiritual frauds. In fact, Paul describes them as lying in wait to deceive. That suggests they're motivated by self-interest. They're motivated by personal gain. They're lying in wait. They, they just want to entrap somebody so that they can get something out of it for themselves. They don't care about the truth. They don't care about their hearers. All they care about is numbers, both in their buildings and in their bank accounts. Now, a spiritually mature believer should have enough understanding of the truth that they can identify when someone isn't being genuine. They should be able to see inconsistencies, or at the very least, they should have the wisdom to investigate that person, to investigate their character, to investigate their history before following after them or before listening to their teachings or before recommending them to other people. They would definitely not recommend someone's teachings to others without first making sure they're worthy of that recommendation. I hope you can see how risky it is if we don't mature, if we don't grow in the faith. We've all had to go through times when we listen to the wrong people, and we maybe only learned it in hindsight. I got caught out recently on WhatsApp, and somebody rang me on WhatsApp and uh, said that, I can't even remember what, how, how the conversation started, but they asked for a specific code, and I was stupid. I'll admit it. I was stupid. I didn't read everything that came up on the screen, and I shouldn't have shared the code with them, but I did. And I lost access to my WhatsApp account, and they ended up starting to send messages to my contacts asking them for money. Now, thankfully, I've got it back again. But it was a very nervous few days almost a week before I got it sorted out. But we can all get caught out. But the more mature we are in the faith, the less likely we will get caught out. Maybe we were spared much of that uh, misdirection as we were growing up because we had a mature, godly believer that would shield us from those influences and we point out the dangers of them and we teach us the truth until we had matured ourselves. Praise God for those people. Maybe you could be that person to somebody else. It's also possible that you maybe can see that vulnerability in your own life now. 
Maybe you realize today that you've been a bit too trusting of some online ministries. Maybe you can think of some preacher you've enjoyed listening to, but when you look at them now, when you analyze what they've been saying, you can see that something that they've said just doesn't match up with what you've heard in this church or what you've heard from some other reliable ministry, or even as you've read the Word of God for yourself. Maybe it's dawning on to you that maybe you're not as mature as you thought you were. That's fine. That's better than fine. It's a brilliant starting point. It's a bit like the person who goes to their first Alcoholic Anonymous meeting, and they stand up and say, hello, I'm Joe Bloggs, and I'm an alcoholic, and everybody applauds them. Why? Because that's the first step to recovery and to getting better, admitting that there's a problem. Now, I'm not saying you've got a drink problem or anything like that. I'm not saying anything like that, but I'm not saying that we're all spiritually immature. But if you personally can see that maybe you've been a bit unstable in doctrine or not quite able to discern or you find yourself a bit unprepared for, be, for deception, then I want you to be encouraged because now you know what it is you need. It's spiritual maturity. You have the desire to die to self. You're passionate about living for Christ, but now you need to know, you, you, you need to grow in faith. That's the whole point of these messages. Now, last week I said that we're going to continue with this third heads forth this week, but I did leave it a wee bit open to carry on longer. We're going to be taking a little bit longer with it because when it comes to growing in faith, we can't afford to pass too quickly over something that we'll need. And we've seen the principle of growing in faith in verses 11 to 13. We've seen the perils of not growing in faith in verse 14. And rather than trying to cram in what I have next, we'll leave it until next week when we'll look next week at the progress, the progress of growing in faith in verse 15. And then, if the Lord allows us, we'll continue looking at the prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T the profit of growing in faith. What can we do in the meantime? Well, we can examine ourselves. We can look at what we've been listening to and what we've been watching. We can look at what we've been reading, what we've been recommending to others, lining it up alongside the Word of God, making sure that it's sound. And if we see that there's something there that's not quite right, well, that's where we need to grow in faith. That's where we need to get stronger in what we believe. And as the Apostle John said, let's test the spirits, whether they be of God. And as we do that, the Lord will help us mature and to be strong as we labor for him. May God bless his word to our hearts. We're going to finish by singing together, Savior, thy dying love thou gavest me, nor should I aught withhold my Lord from thee. My, in love my soul would bow, my heart fulfill its vow, some offering bring thee now, something for thee. Standing together again to sing, please.
Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we pray that we would be not just something for Thee, but all of us will be for Thee. And every part of who we are will be for Thee. We pray, Father, that we would all continue to mature and to grow in faith. None of us have reached full maturity yet. And Father, we thank You that it's a work that You perform within us by Thy Holy Spirit. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we grow, we would become more aware of these dangers, more aware of the deception and deceit that surrounds us, more aware, Father, of the false teachings that would seek to draw us away from the truth. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we would be a people of conviction, a people built upon the Word of God, and a people that adhere and teach the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, continue to make us strong in the faith, we pray, so that all that we do will be done for Thee. We ask you, Lord, that you would just bless those who would leave us now, take them to their homes in safety, Father. We ask that you would be unto them all that they need. And Father, for those of us who remain, to remember our Savior and the way he is appointed, we pray, Father, that these moments would be precious. Bless again the one that would share with us. We pray, Lord, that our time together will be sweet and our remembrance of him will be taken with us in the week that lies ahead. For we ask it in our Savior's name. Amen.